70% of North Americans believe in UFOs, and half of those believe in alien abductions. Here, talk of aliens and the experiences of people who believe they've been abducted by them and the everyday subjects of ordinary conversations and radio phone-ins. If I had to say to somebody, what is this about? I would say that I've come into this lifetime, um, and I've said this since I was old enough to be able to have a thought like this in my head, so maybe eight years old, that all I want to do by the time that I, I die is be wise. I want to know everything that there is to know as a human being. Abductees' accounts can sound like fantasies and they're easy to dismiss. But recently that's begun to change ever since a distinguished Harvard psychiatrist said that he believed his patient's stories. The whole thing sounded like something that had really happened to people. They talked about it like you would talk about a real event, particularly a disturbing event, uh, with appropriate feeling and doubt and all the things that uh, a person of sound mind does. Uh, the only problem was that what they were speaking about is not possible. So I was faced with a dilemma. Um, either I try to take this material and jam it into some kind of old uh, psychiatric model uh, into which it would not fit, or I had to expand uh, my worldview. It was, a, in a sense, it was a, a battle within me between my clinical judgment and the way I was brought up to think that the world was, and I trusted my clinical judgment more than I trusted my worldview. What they're reporting doesn't behave like anything else. It, it's not like fantasy, which is very individual. It isn't like dreams. It's not any kind of delusion. They suffer, as far as I can tell, from no, no kind of psychiatric problem that could account for this. Now, what they're saying has happened to them, we don't believe can happen. That, that's really not my problem, in a sense. That's, that's uh, to figure out how do we reconcile the, those discrepancies. <laughs> The first real experience started um, for me one night with the realization that something was on the end of the bed. We didn't have any animals in the house, and so I, I went through a, a huge panic trying to determine what it might be. And as it stepped its way up on either side of my legs, I began to panic, realizing that I was awake and now this experience was very much in my reality. And it paused and stopped with one knee on my chest, one knee on the other side of me, two arms straddled around my neck. And although my eyes were not open at the time, I was aware that it was very close to me. And from that point in time, um, the next thing I remember was going through the wall, through the doors, through the tree, and into an experience. I have no, no way of describing this because we don't do this normally, but it went inside of my head and it started spitting information at me about 90 million miles an hour colors and shapes and numbers and descriptions and definitions and just an unbelievable amount of information. And as soon as it was done with that, it did the reverse process, taking, taking shots and pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures of my life. And so I literally watched my life pass before me. My first en encounter was in 1989. I went to bed as usual and I woke up and I wasn't in my bed anymore. I was in the downstairs of my house in my living room. And I was standing there in the middle of the living room and not knowing what I was doing there. And all of a sudden I saw these long fingers, very light colored fingers come across my arms. And my body raised up, like it levitated up into the air. And all of a sudden I just went out through our living room window. Um, now, none of this worked. None of this seemed like it was possible. I'm headed towards the window. I'm going, no, no, I'm going to break the window. You know, no, this is impossible. To 
there seems to be a consistent pattern. The pattern that when you first come onto the ship, they give you some moments to adjust. Then they do a physical just to make sure, this is for me, my experience. Um, they make sure that my body's intact, make sure everything's functioning properly, and then we move forward into um, whatever needs to be taught or whatever interaction needs to happen on the ship. I've had apocalyptic visions shown to me. These are probably the most disturbing and most life-altering visions because the message comes across very directly that you're, we're on this path and this is a potential future unless we do something about it. And when you begin to have this information seep into your body as a real knowledge, not as some sort of propaganda that's coming from some left-wing group, your life begins to take on a transformative change. In each of the experiences that I have, whenever they first enter the room, um, I always experience a great sense of, of terror. And what I always have understood is that it's my responsibility to move past that. And the more I invest in that, the more I'm rewarded with knowledge. Initially, the, the people uh, are very traumatized, which is understandable to be taken against your will into a strange environment, probed and poked, and uh, it's traumatic in itself, but you can't tell anybody about it because they'll think you're weird, and it also isn't supposed to happen because our reality doesn't have any room for that, so they undergo what I call ontological shock, which means everything they thought was real is sort of shattered by, by this, and also it can happen again at any time. Their children may be involved, so there's many reasons for trauma. yet. Curiously, uh, most of the people I work with will say, yeah, but there's something, I'm part of something here. They sh I, I resent it, I'm angry, I'm enraged that they don't ask my permission, but I accept to be part of this process and I think it is life-giving. Dr. John Mack believes that by confronting these experiences as real, his patients can move beyond them. All my training, sort of every cell in my body, every bit of my heart and soul goes into just being with these people as they relive the traumatic dimension of it. And when I can do that, which, uh, you know, everything I've been trained to know how to do as a psychiatrist and more is required, uh, just be with them, not, not, not shrink from it, not allow them to lapse into a victim position or just be too, oh, aren't those aliens terrible, but just hold the energy, the, the whole thing moves, it transforms, they'll see divine light, they'll, they'll feel a, a, a tremendous kind of transformational and spiritual opening, uh, which will not happen unless uh, you take them through this kind of dark night of the soul. So in that sense, it has some of the features of, of a kind of um, mystic's journey that starts out with a, with, a, with a tremendously dark, hurtful, wounding kind of trauma. Now, it might be our particular contemporary uh, dark night of the soul because to reach us, this we've reached the point of being so scientific and technologically minded that nothing can reach us unless it starts out in a physical traumatic form. I mean, the, the mystics who believed in God or believed in Source uh, could take their spiritual scotch neat, you know, but uh, for us, uh, who are so cut off from anything like spiritual experience, something has to have a shattering impact. For me, the, this whole world of spirits, of, of gods and goddesses and imagination and aliens too, was, was always, you know, something you could read about or think about or study its meaning to a culture, but it couldn't actually manifest in the physical world. So this has been shattering for my worldview as well. I think in a very subtle way it has broken down, at least intellectually and to a certain degree emotionally, um, the way I see the world. How can I live up to this experience to be as big as this experience is? I'm not trying to fit this into my life. I'm trying to fit into it. We talked with a lot of individuals about their experiences, but there's something about talking with, you know, a group that has collectively experienced the same thing um, that is just more convincing and seems more legitimate. 
In the case where we spoke with young children who had experienced a visitation from two UFOs and the two beings who had hovered over their playground during recess. This was at a small secondary school outside, Zimba, outside Harare in Zimbabwe. And 60 children at recess had seen these two UFOs hover, two alien beings come out. And I even remember how one little girl described it to me. She said, it was as if they were kind of floating above the grass towards us or hopping across the grass towards us. And in this case, um, I remember John's voice very specifically as he asked one little girl. And these were very disciplined, sort of post-colonial, ch little children, um, different races with braids, very well spoken. And John said, well, what would you call these things that you saw? And she'd say, I'd call them aliens. I'd call them alien beings. In September 1994, over 60 children from this school in the suburbs of Harare, Zimbabwe, witnessed several objects landing and two beings coming out. Just over two months later, John and Dominique came to the scene to work with the children, their parents, and the teachers still suffering from shock. John, who essentially specialized in child psychiatry, devoted a great deal of time to interviewing the children. Something scared you, is that right? Yes. What, what scared you? The noise. What noise? The noise that we heard in the air. You heard a noise in the yeah. air? What was it like? Like a roar or a buzz or a hum or what kind of a noise? It was like someone was blowing a flute. It was scary myself. It was scary because you saw something yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw a little object hovering. It was quite big actually and then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver and then we quickly ran to the loud to the logs and we saw a silver, silver thing and we saw a man standing next to it. Uh, what was it, what did it feel like when he was looking at you? I felt scared. It, it felt scared? What was scary about it? Well, I felt scared because I've never seen such a person like that before. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were um, going like that. Where was the pointy part? It was the pointy part in here, or was the pointy part okay. out there, up there? And what was the feeling when you looked at the eyes? Um, it was scary. Mm-hmm. And what? It was scary? Why? What made it scary? The eyes looked evil. Evil. Mm -hmm. And what was evil about them? Mm -hmm. Say what you mean by evil. <laughs> It looked evil because it was just staring at me. With what? Staring at you as if what? As if to do what? As if it wanted to come and take us. As if it wanted to come and take you. That was the feeling you got? That it wanted you to go with it? Did you feel like you wanted to go with it? No. Did you feel, what was the effect on you when, when you felt it wanted to have you go with it? Well, I just um, walked away and I started crying. They came running up here in such a panic. And I mean, even if we had staged it, they could not have run all together like that. Even if we practiced it, I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. That they came up here like a living snake. And they just came, we were in a staff meeting and we just heard them screaming, screaming, ah, and they were here, you know. And the child can't make that up. <coughs> I was very skeptical in the beginning as well. Um, I believed that they'd seen something, but I wasn't prepared to accept that it was anything supernatural or anything like that. But I think the consistency of, of what's been going on indicates that it was more than I was prepared to admit in the beginning. So both of them were running. One was running um, in the trees, and the other one was run, running across the ship. Because mm -hmm. there were also trees here. Mm -hmm. The eyes were, were like more pointed as they came in toward the center of the yeah. head, is that? Right? No, more circular. And this was all black. Yeah. All black. Now you've so made pupils. Did they actually have pupils or yes, was the it The pupils were white. What? The pupils were white like that. And you saw white in the center? Yes, like that. Mm -hmm. Was he near the, uh, the silver object or was he far from? No, on top. On top of the silver yes. object, okay. And um, did you look at him? Yes. 
Did he look at you? Yes, and he gave me the creeps, and I spoke to him. Gave you the creeps. Actually, in your drawing, you showed him standing up, didn't you? Yes, I had to draw him standing up because I couldn't draw him sitting. <laughs> <laughs> What I thought was maybe the, the world's going to end. Maybe they're telling us the world's going to end. Um, well, why do you think they might want us to be scared? <clears throat> because um, we, maybe because we never we don't look after the planet um, the area properly. Mm -hmm. And let uh, me. This is is this an idea that. Uh, you have had before that we don't look after the planet properly in the air or did this idea come to you when you had this experience? When I had this experience. Mm -hmm. And how did that idea come to you from this experience? This is a little hard but try, try to be with me here, okay? When you, how did this idea come to you when you had this experience? I just felt all horrible inside. You felt horrible. At what point did you feel that? When you saw the craft or at, when you got home at night? Or when I got home. You had that horrible feeling when you got home? Yes. And say more about that horrible feeling, Lisa. What was it like? It was like in the world all the trees will just go down and and there will be no air and people will be dying. Mm -hmm. And those thoughts came to you, had you had those thoughts before this experience? No. No. And did, how did those thoughts come to you? Did they come to you from the craft or from... From the man. The man. And the man, did the man say those things to you? Uh, how did he get that across to you? Well, he never said anything. It's just that the face is the eyes. What, what was the sense you got from those eyes? He was interested. <laughs> They uh, describe these experiences or these events like a person talks about something that has happened to them. Uh, and when you're talking with a, a psychotic who's telling you something and it's a delusion and you feel that it really didn't happen, I can tell. I mean, I know this is something that a person wants me to believe or they're frightened or they're distorting reality in some way. There's nothing like that here. These are people of sound mind by and large. Uh, telling me something that's very, they know that I might think they're crazy and so they're a little concerned about telling me and and they, they're very full of questioning themselves and doubt and I mean the way, and then they describe something very real and intense, a light or something happened to their body or it, it, it's the whole quality of the way they talk about it is the way a person talks about experience that, that happened to them.